how do you see this uh, qatari government or regime navigating all through these power dynamics all through these uncertain terrains how do you look at it See, let's say sometimes it seems the Qatari regime is very real politic in let's say even a cynical way because uh, Qatar can present itself as a friend of everybody but as a matter of fact Qatar is no friend of no one in 2022 Qatar did host the FIFA World Cup it has increased its stature at the global level as as a country that's peaceful that can leverage its 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 foreign policy how does it handle the domestic pressure when it comes to the labor laws and how has it navigated through this the domestic uh, issues of labor laborers uh, that fly across from different countries because uh, qatar is a, is a labor uh, deficit country so it's a great question because qatar when you examine the state you have to distinct between uh, actual facts and uh, let's say the presented image we have evidence that uh, hamas officials were in contact in qatar long long before and uh, even in doha long long before but qatar succeeded in a uh, um, let's say sell this uh, uh, charade as uh, Hamas here only because the U.S. asked. Uh, Secretary Blinko, uh, Blinken of the U.S. with uh, a Qatari uh, Prime Minister standing on the podium and uh, we understand that he asked the Qatari Prime Minister if he closed Hamas office, he answered, now we, we need this office in order to communicate with uh, with Hamas on the field. Uh, what are the basic trends that they have to look in, in the futuristic uh, terms? <laughs> Let's be humble. I don't think that I uh, um, managed to, uh, to uh, see things that others don't, but still. Welcome back uh, to the State of Affairs podcast with Maharaj. It has been a while uh, since the last video I published on YouTube and equally important the conversation that we are about to begin. Uh, I'm being joined by a researcher and a friend also uh, from Bar Ilan University who's a PhD candidate and also a researcher. Uh, mostly focuses on uh, Qatar's foreign policy. Uh, from a distance, uh, from from my vantage point, India, we normally uh, do understand about the developments in the West Asian region and also in the Gulf region uh, from the uh, getting the resources and the sources from most of the institutes, the think tanks and also the researchers who are uh, uh, with different universities and also from the news outlets. But today I get a chance to have someone from the uh, place itself uh, it's share it's Ariel uh, Admani. Uh, Ariel, good afternoon. How are you doing? Here it's morning, so good morning to you. Oh uh, yeah, I just forgot. It just skipped. Maybe it's a geographical, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, geographical thing. Normally, uh, apologies for that. But yeah. Uh, no, so, no, no. How have you been doing? Uh, fine. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a difficult year, I know. Uh, everybody can hear uh, hear the news or read the news about uh, Israel in uh, this specific week, in this specific year. Uh, it's been a, a challenge, but uh, in general, I can say uh, I myself uh, good. Thank you for asking. Okay, and and uh, I'll I'll begin with the simple uh, understanding of how do you look. Uh, at Qatar as a country in the Persian Gulf, what's the what's the weight that it carries? Normally, there is a huge amount of uh, you know uh, buzz about this country, brokering talks between different countries wherever the conflict exists. Apart from that, uh, a sports a place where recently we have had uh, uh, you know a football World Cup that uh, came to the conclusion. It, it's just punching uh, every side. How do you look at it? I think the metaphor you just use is a metaphor that the Qatari regime will be happy to hear. Because as a country, uh, for many years, Qatar tried to be uh, in the focus of attention. Um, and in the 1990s, they finally began to address this goal. 
And uh, when they began in 1990 to try to attract attention in many ways, Qatar Foundation now it's, and Qatar Airways are two uh, bodies that everybody knows right now. But when they established in the 1990 uh, in the, uh, as part of the goal to attract international attention, it seems delusional to think that Qatar will be a state that all of the world are going to talk about. And this, uh, the Qatari uh, foreign policy, and also the domestic, but mainly foreign policies, was uh, intended to attract attention, and they succeeded. Right now, uh, when we talk, uh, Qatar is a state that uh, each player around the world uh, uh, even in domestic levels, as you mentioned, sport and energy have to consider, but mainly in international relations, we hear uh, the name of the country a lot of times, especially when we consider it's a very small country that uh, in many, uh, many years look insignificant. Uh, coming back to where we can actually draw a line, because it's not possible to uh, you know, have everything about Qatar to discuss and in, in just a half an hour a podcast. So we'll draw a line from 2017 onwards because that was uh, into the recent past, uh, the Gulf crisis that popularly are called uh, when there was a blockade that was inflicted upon Qatar by the neighboring countries. Uh, has Qatar as a country negotiated with that? Although there was a reapproachment after that uh, by the countries, although Qatar do share uh, cordial relations with its neighbors as we speak, but what after what what immediately happened after 2017? So I mentioned that uh, Qatar was a state that everybody overlooked, and in the 1990, Hamid uh, bin Khalifa, as the mayor, uh, took the country to a world stage, and uh, his son, the the current mayor Tamim, uh, continued this uh, trend, and uh, the other GCC state was. Uh, let's say, try to adjust themselves to the situation. And it was a challenge because Qatar was uh, uh, trying to highlight itself in a manner that sometimes overshadowed the other countries uh, and sometimes were, was at expense of other countries. Uh, Jazeera was uh, another news, Qatari news outlet was critical uh, regarding Saudis and Emiratis and, of course, and others. So in 1970, in, in 1917, as you mentioned, the other GCC state uh, tried, let's say, take Qatar and uh, return it to its normal uh, uh, size, as they uh, call it. And uh, we have an argument about the term. Uh, Qatar will call it a blockade, the Emiratis and Saudis call it uh, several ties. So we are very, very uh, walk on eggshells right now, uh, just in the manner of definition, how we call it. But as a matter of fact, in, in 2017, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Bahrain and Bahrain. Um, uh, tried to make a coalition that uh, made Qatar clear that they are not accepting their policies, especially in their in their relations with terror organization, Al Jazeera, their ties with Iran, and um, they also succeeded in joining uh, uh, other states. There are four states that uh, were uh, at this diplomatic uh, process. And in the bottom line, it's failed. Because uh, when four years later, uh, the Saudis uh, host the Alula declara uh, summit and the Alula declaration that restore uh, ties, <laughs> the one who caved or was the Saudis because uh, Qatar manage a little by local production and mainly by uh, uh, intensified uh, ties with uh, Iran and Turkey, they managed to uh, get by. They managed their, the Qatari economy would just became stronger. The deputy prime minister, who, are, who now the prime minister, Mohammed Rahman Al Thani, said we have a strong resilience. And, 
in a matter of fact, it was right because Qatar was uh, threatened, or let's say Qatar was isolated by four states. Some of them were their closest neighbor that re they relied on many years. And for years, they managed to, in, in economic terms, in, 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 in diplomatic terms, they managed to get by. So this was a test that uh, uh, proved that uh, uh, Qatar can manage alone, can manage by itself. And when we talk about the relations from this point on, I mean, to this day, I think that Qatar and Emiratis and Saudis enjoyed a good control relations, but the tension is still lined uh, under the surface. I mean, we can see in statements and we can see in the remarks that uh, the tension didn't fade away. It still existed, but, but in a much, much lower um, uh, way. And in a, in a manner that, uh, let's say, uh, the administration and the leaderships were tried to uh, ignore it, or let's say overlooked it, because we need, we need to stay together. These four years was difficult to everybody, and we will try to uh, go ahead. Qatar and Emiratis and Saudis, maybe on the sidelines, will try to... Uh, 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 um, still ignited, but as a matter of fact, as official policy, we'll try to be in a reapproachment uh, policy. We, we have, we have, Ariel, we have to give uh, the amount of uh, praise to the Qatar's foreign policy and its administrators for that matter, because it, it. I mean, that's the question that I, I'd be asking about about the country like Qatar. That's you know structured geographically. Uh, in such a way where you have to navigate Iran Saudi rivalry and then uh, relations with Israel and also the Turkey amount of uh, penetration that Turkey has in the entire region of West Asia. Uh, how does it navigate all through this? It's not an easy thing. Obviously, you have to give it uh, also the, uh, the, the it's the blue eyed boy for the uh, United States or for that matter, the West at large. How do you see this? A Qatari government or regime navigating all through these power dynamics, all through these uncertain terrains. How do you look at it? So the Qatari regime is very sophisticated uh, in a way that uh, its state, uh, let's say, in these days, uh, uh, learned how to address the regime because, uh, let's say, sometimes it seems the Qatari regime is very real politic in, let's say, even a cynical way because uh, Qatar can present itself as was the former um, Foreign Minister, uh, Foreign Minister uh, Hamid bin Jassim, one of the architects of the Qatari policy of these days, uh, said we are friend of everybody, but as a matter of fact, Qatar is no friend of to no one. Qatar is very, very uh, um, sophisticated uh, partner that tried to uh, hold it all together and sometimes uh, it can be difficult uh, let's say uh, the blockade or the tie that uh, the four years that uh, you mentioned is an example how this policy uh, uh, br bring about Qatar a uh, prob problem or uh, let's say even difficulties so Qatar all the time tried to be connected to every player and sometimes it will bring anger and the criticism and scrutiny, but Qatar never, uh, let's say, sever ties on uh, an ide ideological basis. Because in the bottom line, it's not ide ide ideological, it's uh, politics. And the Qatar regime is looking its uh, its ties, no matter if the Washington or Tehran, uh, Taliban or Israel, Hamas or uh, India. It's a business. It's a business. It's a politics, and I will address it in a manner that, in the bottom line, will try uh, to look what will benefit my country for the long term. 
Sometimes I want diplomatic relations that can give me a, a here's I had uh, an edge in uh, brokering. Sometimes I would look the financial aspect and gas re- gas relations and and uh, and uh, gas uh, um, uh, terms. And I will try to see each country how can I uh, produce even I say uh, from this country the most beneficial aspects to Qatar. Uh, so my my question is again that uh, in in 2022 Qatar did host the FIFA World Cup it has increased its stature at the global level as as a country that's peaceful that can leverage its 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 foreign policy uh, because it has natural resources because it's energy rich because it has uh, it has a potential to act as the mediator that it normally does with many countries with many uh, uh, superpowers for that matter but the thing is how does it handle the domestic pressure when it comes to the labor laws because that have been uh, in the limelight at the global forums uh, and how has it navigated through this the domestic uh, issues of labor laborers uh, that fly across from different countries because uh, qatar is a, is a labor uh, deficit country uh, and having su- uh, such a massive economy to run it does need people from around it does need people from other countries like south asia or other parts of the world but there are there, there are certain red flags that uh, forums like um, human rights international has Uh, basically highlighted in, in before the world cup was host, hosted uh, by qatar so how do you see as a balancing act how does qatar uh, manage all this uh, has it made certain political reforms that it promised it will introduce uh, there is no follow up uh, it was just before uh, the fifa world cup started uh, it was all about the auctions uh, it promised it that it will bring in the political reforms the social reforms especially with the laborers uh they were complaining about the uh, about the treatment that are, that are, that's being met to them in in qatar itself uh, so global organizations for human rights have taken a note of that still uh, there is it has not dented it has not uh, basically frightened qatar to take its uh, foreign policy post- postures whatever it does how do you see it how, how do you look at this problem So it's a great question because Qatar when you examine the state you have to distinct between uh, actual facts and uh, let's say the presented image the PR states that sometimes people call it Qatar and the uh, the actual uh, um, let's say happening on the ground because sometimes uh, it's very contradicting Uh, you mentioned uh, that the FIFA World Cup presents Qatar as peaceful. And indeed, Qatar tried to highlight the World Cup as the safest World Cup, and it was with less evidence, but uh, less, uh, let's say, uh, disturbance and, uh, and uh, other uh, problem. But let's say that it was because the, the Qatari regime monitoring the, the state very closely. I mean, they banned sometimes alcohol, alcohol in the streets. In a manner, they, they try to please the domestic angle, but also in a manner that will preserve uh, stability and other uh, goals. But we need to remember that this is the image that presented outside. Inside, It's a regime that close very uh, very very close uh, um, about his residents and when we uh, mentioned the residents you mentioned the work lab the laborers we need to remember in Qatar there is a very very strong distinction between the natives and the non natives because in Qatar it doesn't matter if you are British or American or Indian or Bangladesh Bangladesh. You are a foreigner in Qatar you will remember that you're not integral part of the society sometimes we can see there is a separation in malls and beaches and uh, even sometimes Qatar even uh, hosted uh, in one of their national days uh, they made a slogan about uh, they t- bring two hands that co- uh, together they Uh, 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 made a collective form and, and the message was we are together natives and non-natives but during the same national day there was a parade to Qatari residents and 
a parade to Qatari uh, natives. I mean, the separation is very clear. In Qatar, you will remember that you are not uh, local. You will feel it in your bones, even you don't ma- if, you, if you don't want. And so this is why the image that Qatar presented to the world was uh, they will do reforms and they will address the problems. But as a matter of fact, when, as you mentioned, uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, forums or institutional or, or um, um, even government-based institutions um, will try to... Uh, really examine the situation on the ground, they see the reformer was basically lip service. I mean, yeah, the Qatari, I mentioned, they abolished the Kapala system, the system that allow uh, uh, even uh, someone called it enslaved, the, the, the workers. But um, one forum, uh, one distinguished forum mentioned that a year after, when you look at the, 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 status, the status of the worker right, you will see that basically the change just changed slightly. The same manner Qatar, will, uh, uh, Qatar tried to uh, highlight itself as a democratic process because they made an election to the CMC, the Central Municipal Council. But as a matter of fact, the leadership is still <laughs> from the closest family, the royal family, and the closest families that they choose. I mean, so this is why when Qatar do, as you say, balancing acts, that you need to separate the, let's say, the truth change from it, uh, the cosmetic one, the what happened to Qatari natives and Qatari non-natives. And sometimes it looks like a cynical game because you are international actor, you need to act like one. But as a matter of fact, uh, sometimes the cynical way uh, uh, can be uh, in a manner that can be anger, uh, uh, let's say, uh, produce anger. There are things think in the U.S. that call Qatar uh, the, the unreliable partner because this uh, duplicity sometimes as it seems. When we talk about another element called uh, the uh, Qatar is offering its uh, its offices to the countries that do have certain conflict issues. Uh, most of the analysts term it as the mediator. Uh, for that matter, also, it's using this very element of mediation in order to get favors for that matter or a goodwill from other countries like US, like West. Recently, it has held talks between earlier in, between Afghanistan and the US, uh, you know, representatives. And apart from that, also, after the Hamas attack, there are certain, uh, you know, certain uh, analysts term that Qatar is offering its good offices to both the countries, uh, to the people who are involved. Uh, to the parties who are involved uh, for the resolution of the conflict. Is it like Qatar, because of offering the good offices to the uh, conflict parties, certain things do go un- under the carpet? Uh, or how good way can we, uh, you know, uh, can we assume that Qatar does offer its best offices? It's a great mediator. How do you look at this phenomena? I think that we mentioned in the last question the duplicity and the duplicity is continue when we talk about mediation brokering because when we examine Qatari brokering uh, process we see that the, this mediation allows Qatar to present itself as a global actor, as an international actor. Uh, during October 7th there was many uh, states that actually uh, came to Doha uh, to ask Doha help uh, in this conflict, and uh, even the states that uh, many sometimes overlooked, uh, Serbia and Herzegovina, <laughs> came to Qatar to ask for its help. And to this day, Qatar is still a, a state that mentioned uh, on the news outlets as a country that everyone tried to please. And, and as you say, at the same time. Under the carpet, we can see the fact there are reports about how Qatar funded Hamas. And there were reports from CIA um, 
officials as uh, one user that pointed out. So it's not a secret. But Qatar at the same time will try to present one image and in, this, uh, in, in the truth matter, they'll be doing their own goals. For an example, the Hamas office, the Hamas office and the Taliban office. Qatar presented this um, in a very explicit manner as a way to bring, as you say, uh, peace and stability to the region. And they will argue that uh, it was uh, under the request of uh, the U.S., the, the Qatar ambassador to the U.S. from the royal family, Afani, uh, was uh, published an, an article, uh, let's say a, a month after the war began in Israel, that Ka uh, the U.S. asked Qatar to open its uh, embassies. And uh, history aside, we have evidence that uh, Hamas officials were in contact in Qatar long, long before, and uh, even in Doha long, long before. But Qatar succeeded in, uh, um, let's say, sell this uh, uh, charade as uh, Hamas here only because the U.S. asked. And in the same manner, when uh, Secretary Blinko, uh, Blinken of the U.S. with uh, uh, Qatari uh, Prime Minister standing on the podium and uh, uh, we understand that he asked the Qatari Prime Minister if he closed Hamas office, he answered, now we, we need this office in order to communicate with, uh, with Hamas on the field in order to bring peace and stability. So this duplicity also against uh, the Taliban. I mean, we can see the fact that they hold strong relationship with the Taliban and with uh, unlawful uh, activities sometimes, but Qatar will present it in a manner that we are the reason that not all uh, women education in the country is abolished. We are trying to educate them in order to uh, bring uh, women rights. As a matter of fact, we can see that in Afghanistan, the women's rights is very, very poorly. But Qatar will present it in, a, in, in the, the PR they are uh, in a very, very smart and sophisticated and problematic manner. They will try to keep Qatar on the limelight and the good limelights. And in this, I uh, will try to add one remark. In Qatar, bad publicity is still a publicity, as the idiom goes. I mean, we prefer that we will stay on uh, the news in a bad manner for a short time. We will try how to manage it, we will try how to reduce it, but still, it's, we prefer bad publicity or no publicity. We as a country experienced no publicity. We didn't want to go back there. We prefer to stay item number one, we will try to be in a positive manner, but we will uh, get along if it's if always, uh, also if it's gonna be in a in a negative manner. Uh, th that's quite interesting analysis of the of the, of the topic and and of the very uh, basic thing what I was asking about. Uh, one last thing I would like to hear from you for the uh, students and researchers. Uh, how do you see the future trajectory of Qatar's foreign policy? Uh, what are the trends that we have to look at? We must look into because uh, will be there are a number of researchers who look at this region. Uh, what are the basic trends that they have to look into in the futuristic uh, terms? <laughs> Let's be humble. <laughs> I don't think that I uh, um, managed to uh, to uh, see things that others don't. But still, if I try to uh, uh, locate a point that I think overlooked is the fact that um, we mentioned in the beginning uh, the gas. Uh, the, the Qatar tried from the beginning of the war to preserve much contracts as they can with French and Italy and China because they're not committed to any side and um, uh, it states that uh, sometimes many overlooked Bangladesh and Uzbekistan and uh, that's in a manner that Qatar will be a state 
that always be relevant, always be important, because the low calls in the U.S. and in the West, uh, because they funded Hamas and, uh, and uh, had a strong uh, and have strong relationship with the Taliban, to sever ties with Qatar. Uh, the, the, these calls were also mentioned in uh, a decade ago, and I don't think they're going anywhere. Because Qatar is here to stay, Qatar will uh, continue to preserve its status because they managed to invest itself in so many ways. I mean, I mentioned the gas, I mean, uh, diplomatic relation, and I think that the aspect that sometimes overlooked is the investment. Qatar Investment Authority, this massive financial force that is basically government run, is invested in many, many sectors that even a country uh, rose today and say enough is enough regarding Qatar, they basically can't. Here, there were calls in Britain in the beginning of the war. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak called uh, in the first days uh, to uh, sanction Qatar. Just two weeks later, he, he complimented Qatar and their uh, humanitarian role, etc., etc. I think that when we examine this shift change, we need to remember that Qatar is invested not just in governments, but also in the London uh, um, Water Company. Because Qatar would, uh, we found and still find every crack they can be useful. They will invest heavily. And sometimes, uh, let's say the... Uh, the profit from this investment will come much later. But as a matter of fact, this is a Qatari manner that will uh, put Qatar uh, on the limelight, on the focus. And this is why, let's say, I, will, I believe that even years ahead, Qatar will still be a topic that every one of us need to address.